All right, today we're going to talk about what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth about sex. A boring subject matter, I know, try to stick with me. <laughs> I want to start by making some observations about sexuality. And for a moment, I just want to ask that we think about these things, not by way of passing judgment on them or evaluating them. I just want to reflect together for a moment about certain observations and what they have to tell us about the role that sexuality plays in human existence. Just some observations about this area of life. Experiences of sexual feelings, the experience of sexual gratification are so intense that sexual addictions are the single most prominent behavioral addiction in the world and nothing else comes close. That's how strong they are. And you may know the pain of that. Like you know what it's like to battle with watching something that your values tell you not to watch or to visit a website regularly because there's a habitual pattern in your life that you wanna stop, but it feels like you can't. Pornography is a $100 billion industry. I mean, that's enough money to feed at least 5 billion people a day. The porn industry makes more money than Major League Baseball, the NFL, and the NBA combined. In a world where there are so many things to think about and so many things to learn, there are more internet sites devoted to sexual stimulation than any other subject matter on earth. Sexual attractiveness is so desired and admired that it's used to sell every product you can imagine. Prostitution is so ubiquitous that it is referred to as the world's oldest profession. It's universally present. Out of all the ways that people can get hurt, no violation of any person wounds them quite like sexual violations do. When a child gets sexually molested, when someone gets raped, a heart gets scarred about as deeply as a human heart can get scarred. No act causes quite the same damage to a relationship than sexual infidelity does. It's the ultimate form of betrayal. It's maybe harder for a relationship to recover from or harder to trust uh, to rebuild around that than any other relationship wound. The desire to appear sexually attractive makes people jump through all kinds of hoops. It makes people buy new and more clothes. It makes people go on more diets and exercise plans. It makes people go through more elective surgery than anything else. It makes young women in our society sometimes starve themselves, sometimes starve themselves to death. It's a powerful thing. The promise of sexual excitement, the prospect of a few moments of sexual gratification has the power to make powerful people, actors, movie producers, politicians, pastors, university presidents, CEOs, trash their reputations, ditch their marriages, capsize their families, and lose their careers. The prospect of a few moments of sexual excitement makes some of the smartest people in the world act like they have a lower IQ than their pets. And the question is why? And there are two ways that you can take this question. One is, why would people pay that kind of price for sexual gratification or excitement or fulfillment? Why would people run those kinds of risks? Why do they pursue it with such desperate, unflagging urgency? The other way you can ask this question is, why do we make such a big deal about it? Why do we talk about it in such loaded terms? Why do we get so exercised about it? Why do we speak of betrayal or molestation or abuse or sexual immorality? Why do we use moral language around it when physically speaking, it's just a simple act? It's just body parts and nerve endings. It's, it only involves the expression of inevitable biological urges. So why does it have this power over us? Why does it create longing and desire, foolishness and regret, hope and joy, or guilt and shame and remorse like no other activity on earth? Well, at the front of this message, I just want to lay my cards out on the table. Sometimes, even in churches, this discussion gets posed in terms of a number of problems associated with it. Sexually transmitted diseases, the presence or absence of emotional scars, unwanted pregnancies, the 
birth apart from marriage or the social impact of single parenthood. And these are all important things. They're all worth discussing. We're not gonna talk about any of them in this message though, because frankly, none of them gets to the core of why the apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth about the expression of human sexuality. And frankly, if you had the technology, if you could wave a magic wand and make all of those problems disappear, then the heart of the matter still remains because this is the great dividing line. This is the great choice point when it comes to sexuality. The writers of scripture say that sexual intimacy is not just a simple act and it does not just involve body parts and nerve endings. It is not what your teacher told you in seventh grade health class. Do you remember what that was? Boys and girls, this is a this and this is a that. And you take the this and you do this with that and then you've had sex. And safe sex is covering this with that so that that doesn't happen. <laughs> sex is not simply biology or a study of anatomy. Sex is so explosively powerful because we're dealing with something that deeply involves the human soul. I wanna tell you something that's very important to spiritual life. And a lot of times it's not very well understood, sometimes even in churches. Bodies and souls are much more connected than most people think. They're much more intertwined than a lot of people are aware of. The writer, a writer by the name of Craig Barnes, he notes that according to writers in scripture, God did not create you as a soul and then just wrap you around a disposable body. He created Adam's body, we're told, and then he breathed into it the breath of life. And that means that what goes on with your body is intimately connected with what goes on with your soul, in your soul. They're inextricably linked. And instinctively, like we're all aware of this, we sense this to be true. If there's someone I don't want to get close to me, get close to my soul, to my inner person, one of the ways I experience this is I don't want them to get close to my body. Uh, anthropologists say every culture has rules about this, how close people will let each other get to them physically before they start to feel like, hey, you're violating my personal space. An anthropologist says that this varies from one culture to another. So among Italians, I mean, you could be pretty much nose to nose and it doesn't bother anyone. Among the British, it's like arm's length away. Among Dutch people, those I grew up with, like the preferred spacing is one person per room. Uh, like if someone is in the same room, it's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> You're getting a little close to my personal space. That's why, part of why there's probably not a population boom going on in the Netherlands. <clears throat> if someone connects with me spiritually, we talk about it in physical terms. I say, I was moved by that person. If someone connects with my soul, I'll say, they touched me. And we're careful about who we let touch us because there's something real deep when someone touches me. What we do with our bodies matters to our souls. It's not just body parts and nerve endings. And this is most profoundly true when it comes to sex. The teaching of scripture is that the longing that your body experiences is not just a biological urge. It's not just your DNA programmed to promote the survival of the species for another generation as it continues to evolve. The longing of your body is an expression of the longing of your soul. And it is deeply rooted in your spiritual existence. When bodies become one in that way, it's a picture of something that is spiritually transcendent and very deep and reflects the heart of the spiritual reality. And especially ever since the fall, when we feel cut off and alone, it's an expression of our desire to not be alone, like sin leaves us alone. There's an old quote, it's, uh, sometimes it's attributed to G.K. Chesterton, no one is sure where it came from, but it goes like this. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is really looking for God. He is really looking for that which can take away his aloneness. And I think an awful lot of people who engage in sex outside of marriage don't do it because they set out to be promiscuous people. I think they do it because they're lonely. Because there's a voice inside every one of us that says, I was made for connection. I was made to be loved. 
and that voice will not be stilled. And it knows to be unconnected and to be alone is not good. And it is, it is to die a little. And because sex is such an explosively powerful experience, because it's so breathtakingly intense, people mistakenly think that it will uh, take away their aloneness. It might for a few minutes. It might distract for a little while. But don't be deceived. It's not just body parts and nerve endings. You see, in a sense, in a very real sense, when you engage in sexual intimacy, you're not just touching someone's body. You come as close as is, as is humanly possible in this world to touching someone's soul. That's not why it's so unspeakably intimate and sensitive and delicate and powerful. It's as close as any human being can come in this world to touching someone else's soul. Sex is inevitably a spiritual experience, whether we not acknowledge it or not. God designed it that way. It's the mingling of two souls to experience a kind of oneness. And that's why it's so powerful. And that's why people chase after it with such desperate abandon and pay such a high price for it. And that's why when people engage in sex outside of God's design, outside of the permanent exclusive commitment of marriage, it does something destructive to their souls. Because now they're starting to give away little pieces of their soul here and a little piece of their soul there, and they don't feel whole anymore. It may feel quite intense and powerful and good for the moment, but it feels kind of empty or hollow eventually. And there are feelings of guilt or remorse or abandonment or betrayal, because it's like you're leaving little pieces of your soul scattered in every bed that you've ever occupied. I'll give you an image of what happens in sex. Like if you were to go up to Tahoe when it's winter, when it's below 32 degrees, go outside, get your tongue real wet with saliva, and walk up to a metal pole, like a stop sign or something like that. Put your tongue on the pole and hold it there while your tongue freezes and bonds to the metal, and then just walk away. And then you will experience something of what goes on when you're involved sexually with someone, when there's, uh, there's not this sole permanent marriage commitment. Have you ever seen the movie about a kid named Ralph called A Christmas Story? If you have, remember there's this scene where a boy named Flick gets triple dog dared to uh, stick his tongue to a flagpole? Well, just to make sure this image sticks in your mind, I'd like you to see that clip. Uh, so check this out. This is serving a spiritual purpose. You're full of beans and so is your old man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Says who? Says me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I double dare you. The exact exchange and nuance of phrase in this ritual is very important. Huh. Are you kidding? Stick my tongue to that stupid pole, that's dumb. That's cause you know it'll stick. You're full of it. Oh, yeah? Yeah! Well, I double dog dare you! Now it was serious. A double dog dare. What else was left but a triple dare you? And finally, the coup de grace of all dares, the sinister triple really dog dumb. dare. I triple dog dare you! Schwartz created a slight breach of etiquette by skipping the triple dare and going right for the throat. All right, all right. Yeah, Come on, kid. <sighs> well, go on, smart and do it. I'm going, I'm going. Flick's spine stiffened, his lips curled in a defiant sneer. There was no going back now. This is nuts.
All right, so three moments. First, that moment of casual bravado, like this is nothing. And then that moment when the light dawns and he realizes what's happened. And then that moment of horrible aloneness where he's just begging, don't leave me, don't leave me. Because at the end of that scene, Flick knows what's coming. He knows that when he walks away, he's gonna walk away and he's gonna leave a little piece of himself attached to that metal flagpole and that's gonna hurt. People say, you know, it's just sex, it's just bodies, it's just an urge. I can have sex with this person and just walk away. No, you can't. Not without leaving a part of yourself frozen in that bedroom, you can't. When you have sex with another person, you leave a little piece of your soul with them. You lose a little bit of your wholeness. In the moment, it can feel so good because it's such a powerful experience because it was designed to be that way. But then eventually, the next morning, someday, when you take a real close look in the mirror, you find there's something that's kind of empty. There's something kind of hollow. There's some nagging sense of not being whole, not being right, because there are little pieces of your soul that are scattered everywhere. It's not just about body parts. This is why Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. He says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. In other words, your body was designed by God and there's a close connection, there's a close interaction between what happens in your body and what happens in your soul. And that's part of what makes life and bodies so wonderful. That's part of what makes sexuality so wonderful, but also makes it so powerfully destructive when it's misused. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The body is meant for the Lord, for God's purposes. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. And then Paul writes these words, which are, which are so often unpopular in our day. Flee from sexual immorality. Now, why does God say that? Is it because God is opposed to pleasure or opposed to sex? No, because God created pleasure and God created sex. Have you ever thought about that? God did not have to create sex as the way to get the reproduction job done. Sometimes people think that it's all, that's all it's about. Like God didn't have to choose sex to be the way to get the reproduction job done. Like he could have done it a lot of other ways. Like he could have chosen a secret handshake. <laughs> like he could have made a hidden button somewhere and you just press the button and say the magic word and out pops a little life. He didn't do that. He chose sexuality. He chose sexual expression, sexual intimacy, and it's such a good thing, and I'm so glad he chose it. You think about this. The ultimate sexual fulfillment of a man and a woman having an orgasm was God's idea. It wasn't invented by someone in the first century. It was God's idea. Maybe you're thinking, I can't believe you just said orgasm. <laughs> well, God created it. God created it, and if you think about that for a moment, how could God be trying to ruin all the fun with sex when he created it? He created it to be so pleasurable. He wants people to have that experience within the boundaries of a committed marriage. But like any great power, God knows the damage that sexuality can do when it's misused. Just like a fire can be so constructive, but so damaging if it's misused. It's the same with sexuality. Now, people can deny or ignore what the writers of scripture say about sexuality if they want to. A lot of people do, but there will be consequences. Maybe you come to church, but you don't wanna look at God. You feel a sense of guilt or distance. You try to sing songs about God's goodness and they kind of just choke in your throat. You feel lonely. Maybe you get married, but instead of the oneness that you wanna find, these past memories are like haunting you because they're like little pieces of your soul that are scattered everywhere from your marriage. It turns out it's not just body parts and nerve endings. This is why Jesus taught that sexual intimacy is intended by God to be reserved for a marriage and the context of an exclusive, permanent, committed marriage relationship with one another. God says, if you're not married to someone, keep your hands off their soul because you're gonna do damage. Because when you become sexually intimate with someone, a sexual transaction and a spiritual transaction takes place 
and souls mingle together. And in some sense that you don't fully understand, you become one and you leave a little piece of your soul and it can't be undone. It can't get pulled apart. It can't get separated. You might as well take two rivers that have flowed into one and have gone a mile downstream and then try to pull apart the water that belongs to one river from the other. I mean, it can't be done. This means every one of us is confronted with a choice. Will I honor God and his design for my sexuality? Will I reserve sexual intimacy for marriage? Will I make whatever changes I need to make to get in harmony with God's intent? And I know this stirs up a lot of thoughts and I want to address a few of them. There's a, a comment that I've heard from couples, usually from men more often than I can count. Someone will say, marriage is just a piece of paper. So what's the big deal about waiting until you get married? Why should I reserve sex for marriage? It's just a piece of paper. We can love each other without a piece of paper. We can be together without a piece of paper. We can have a commitment to each other without a piece of paper. What's the big deal about a piece of paper? I wanna th talk about this for just a moment. I've been thinking about how that argument would go in other contexts. For example, if you're a manager, try a little experiment this month. At the end of the month, don't pay your employees. And when they come to you and complain, tell them, what's the big deal about a paycheck? Like, it's just a piece of paper. Why can't we work together without a piece of paper? Why can't we have a company? Why can't we build things without a piece of paper? If you're in education, wait until commencement, and then when it happens and people are all walking across the stage, don't give them a degree. And when they come to you and they whine about it afterwards, say, what's the big deal about a degree? Like, what's the big deal about a diploma? It's just a, a piece of paper. Like, we can learn together without a piece of paper. We can have education without a piece of paper, can't we? The next time a police officer writes you a ticket, try a little experiment. Just rip it up, throw it back in his face. And then when he asks you why you just did that, say, you know, what's the big deal about a piece of paper? It's just a piece of paper. We can drive without a piece of paper, can't we? <laughs> See, here's the problem with marriage is just a piece of paper argument. It's unbelievably stupid. Marriage is not just a piece of paper, and no one has ever given about 30 seconds of consideration ever would say it is. Marriage is a promise. Marriage is a vow. And the vow, when it's authentically offered, is the most solemn act of self-giving that a human being is capable of. And a promise is what makes oneness possible. When someone says to another person, in a shaky, unstable, chaotic world, there is one thing that you can count on. You can count on me. You understand that's what makes families possible? That's what makes a life for children stable? A promise. Among citizens, it's what makes a country possible. This whole dream that God has of oneness in our shaky world rests on the foundation of promises. And a marriage is a promise. It's not a piece of paper. It's a vow of uh, commitment and fidelity that I will seek to honor with my body and soul as long as we both shall live. It's done publicly so that I go on record before God and human society of which I am a part of that I will from this day forward be accountable for this sacred pledge. It's written on a piece of paper because we live in a literate society so that it's a tangible, permanent witness. I, I took a vow, I made an oath, I gave my word. So this is a, just a fair warning. Don't even start with the piece of paper thing. Marriage is not a piece of paper. Marriage is demandingly costly. It can be sobering, it can be joyful, it can be heart-wrenching. It can demand sacrifice, but it ain't a piece of paper. It's a promise. And community gets built on promises. Sometimes people will say something along these lines, Hey, you know what? I don't feel any guilt or shame. I've done what you've been talking about. We live together. We sleep together. We don't feel any shame about it at all. I feel great. Bruce Meads wrote a wonderful book called Shame and Grace. And he notes that there are only two kinds of people who feel no shame at all. One of them is someone who is perfect, someone who is whole, who is right. They feel no shame because there's nothing in them to be shamed about or guilty about. The other kind of person who feels no shame is someone who is living in denial, someone who is living an illusion. Sometimes people violate God's intent for sexuality, and not only do they do that, 
but they don't experience much pain over it and they're kind of proud of it. Like, I broke the mold. You know, those consequences that you talk about, they don't apply to me. I don't feel anything about it at all. It's like someone were to say, like, hey, I stuck my tongue on the pole. I walked away. It doesn't hurt. I don't feel anything as they're bleeding all over the place. The only way that he could not feel the pain is if he is in denial or, and get this, if he somehow destroyed the nerve endings of his tongue. If you destroy the nerve endings of your tongue, you're not going to feel the pain. And if you've done that, you're in more trouble than you thought. People destroy the nerve endings of their soul. They destroy the healthy sense of hurt and pain they're supposed to feel so they don't do the things that hurt them. It's possible for people to destroy their sensitivity. And that might happen, but it's not something to be a proud of. It's a pretty dangerous place to be, actually. Now, I know anytime there's a discussion like the one we're having today, some people will think something along these lines. They'll say, you're telling me I have only one choice, like marriage or abstinence? You're telling me either I've got to get married, I've got to commit myself to that one person for the rest of my life, or I'm supposed to go without sex altogether? You must be joking. Like, what world are you living in? Do you not understand this is the 21st century? There is no way. Like, that is just way too difficult. You must be some kind of low testosterone, libido challenged, hormone deprived, inefficient guru. Well, first of all, Let's just leave my testosterone out of this. <laughs> but second of all, it's not too hard. It has been done by millions of people in every century, on every culture, including this one. And there are in our church hundreds of people, including single people, who with God's help through prayer and devotion and community are seeking to honor God in their sexual lives. And I just want to say one word here, and I want to be as direct as I know how to be. Don't you dare try to lure or tempt any of them to leave that path. It is too difficult. It is too painstaking. It costs too much. If someone is on that road and they're seeking with God's help to honor him in that way, whatever choice you make around this issue, like if you try to get someone to abandon their attempt to follow God, you face the most serious kinds of consequences before God that a human being can imagine. So don't do that. Not here. And I'll tell you something else on this one. I have counseled with a whole lot of people in my life. I have heard a lot of people express a lot of regrets for a lot of things that they've done and a lot of experiences that they haven't had. I've never met a human being who got to the end of their life and said, you know, I wish I would have had more experiences sexually with people. Like I wish I'd have slept with more people. I wish I'd have had a bigger variety of sexual partners. That's what I regret. That's what I wish I would have had. I wish I'd have had a greater smorgasbord of wilder sexual experiences outside of a committed marriage. I've never, I've never, I've heard a lot of regrets. I've never heard that one, not once, never. I've never known someone to get to the end of their life and look back on it and wish they had gone outside of marriage for more and wilder sexual experiences. Maybe you have a choice to make now. You're involved in behavior or a relationship that is violating God's design for your sexuality. And I just want to tell you, it needs to stop. You need to stop it now. If you're a couple and you've been involved sexually outside of God's design, this is going to take character and courage, but make a decision that it stops today. Honor God, honor yourselves, honor your soul, care for your soul, honor your relationship, honor the marriage that you might one day be in by resolving not to give your bodies to one another until you're ready to promise a permanent exclusive commitment to give your soul. Maybe you're in a relationship and there's been sexual activity and you're not married yet and you know where your deepest values lie. That's why you're listening right now. But the person that you're involved with is not listening with you. They're not hearing this message. And that means that you're gonna have to have a very difficult conversation. And I just wanna encourage you to have it. Have it today. Tell them, I wanna do my sexual life, my sexual uh, experience the way that God designed it to be. I'm gonna reserve sexual intimacy for marriage. 
and nothing else. And if that's a problem, maybe you sit down with them and you listen to this message together. And if they still don't come around, if they're still trying to pressure you, well, tell them this, tell them, I want you to go stick your tongue to something metal in the freezer and then walk away. And after that, we'll talk. (laughs) Maybe you're real aware of brokenness in this area of life. And you've been thinking for a long time now about how there are little pieces of your soul scattered around and it's been blocking you off from feeling spiritually whole and right with God and clean and together. And I just want you to know, God is in the business of restoring broken souls. He made them in the first place. And he can gather all of the hurts and the wounds and the memories and the mistakes that tear you apart and he can make your soul whole again. God can do that. You know, Jesus was really clear about this. And it's quite remarkable. Some of the people who were attracted to Jesus the most were people who experienced the deepest levels of hurt and regret and brokenness in this area. Jesus went to a well one time, and it was noon, the middle of the day, the heat of the day, and there was one woman there. And in the course of their conversation, Jesus let her know that he knew all about her past. She had been married five times. She was living with a guy right now that wasn't her husband. And the reason they were alone at the well in the middle of the day was because no one else would go to the well to get water when it was that hot during the day. But she did because she couldn't stand the stairs anymore. She couldn't stand the shame. She couldn't stand the mirror that she saw in other people's eyes. And Jesus looked at her and he loved her and he said, I've got water to give you. And anyone who drinks from my water will never thirst again. And she had been really thirsty for a long time. A group of self-righteous men brought a woman before Jesus one time who had been caught in a sexual sin. And they all had stones in their hands and they were going to kill her. And Jesus said to them, at great risk to himself, knowing that he would pay an enormous price for this, Jesus said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they all dropped them. And she looked at Jesus and she finally saw a man who didn't want to use her or abuse her or throw stones at her. And he said, they don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go, be whole, sin no more. Jesus was real clear. This world is not divided up into people who are perfectly holy and then people who are messed up. Our church is not divided up that way. Every one of us is broken, and that includes all of our sexuality. And there is no room for smugness or self-righteousness or judgmentalism on anyone's part. And God can bring to every one of us a sense of healing and restoration and mercy and forgiveness and grace and new beginnings and cleansing and freedom and wholeness like you wouldn't believe. Just ask him. Tell him where you've gotten off track. Tell him you want to experience forgiveness and newness and freedom. Just give him a chance. He's a faithful God. And this is too important, the subject. This is not about body parts and nerve endings. This is about your soul. All right, let me pray for you. God, I pray for the people who are listening right now who have Uh, business to do with you that they have not done yet regarding their sexuality and the brokenness in them. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just continue to speak to them, continue to convict them, continue to prompt them in this area to make the right decisions, to make the right commitments that they need to make so that they can be free, they can live guilt-free and shame-free in this area of their sexuality. God, I pray that we would honor you with our sexuality. I pray that we would make commitments to fidelity, to abstinence, until we get to that point where we are ready to make a a committed, lifelong, permanent uh, relationship in a marriage. And God, when we do that, I pray that you would honor that and that you would allow us to experience fulfillment sexually the way that you designed us to experience it. Would you bless us in that way, God? But would you 
just continue to help us take the next right step that we need to take in this area of our lives. We're going to need your help with that. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.